as we study through the book of Ephesians, which is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. There are three main themes. One, Christ has reconciled all creation to himself and to God. Two, Christ has united people from all nations to himself and to one another in his church. And three, Christians must live as new people. Ephesians offers general instruction in the truth of God's redemptive work in Christ, the unity of the church among diverse peoples, and proper conduct in the church, the home, and the world. Ephesians, brought to life, brought together. Well, welcome. We're glad that you joined us for this video sermon. Obviously, due to the weather, uh, we weren't able to gather as a body of believers, but that doesn't mean that we don't uh, continue as a church. And, and this is an opportunity for us to keep up with the series leading up to Easter, uh, like we're going to do without having to come back next week and back it up. So we wanted to go ahead and get this message out to be a part of it. We're glad that you've joined us uh, for this, and we hope that you continue to join us throughout this series and check out our resources page for this uh, this particular series, which has been uh, got devotions and daily readings and the discussion guides and all those things uh, that really help you uh, grow as you look through the book of Ephesians. We're, we're in a series we're calling Brought to Life, Brought Together. And we are really excited at this uh, book by, or verse by verse, chapter by chapter kind of study of this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church. He wrote it first, obviously, to the, book, to the uh, church in Ephesus. But most scholars believe it's a general letter, that it's a circular letter, that it didn't stop there, that it was passed on to the other churches which Paul uh, ministered, helped start, helped encourage as well. But it's a great letter encouraging people. It doesn't uh, bring out any specific heresy or problem going on, but just encourages people about who they are in Christ. It's really about your identity in Christ because once you discover who you are in Christ, or, or rather whose you are, as you belong to Christ and he, he chose you as a part of his family, once you get that down, other things start falling in place in a big way. So we've been studying this. We went through the first couple chapters and it's been really good uh, as we've looked and, and found out a little bit more about uh, um, the gospel of Christ and who we are in Christ and how we've been chosen. And last week we really looked at that we are saved by grace for good works, not saved by good works, but saved by grace. And we really looked uh, intently at that. Uh, today we're going to look at unity in Christ. We're talking about brought to unity. And, and I'm just going to tell you up front, I'm going to give you two points that we're going to talk about in this message uh, from the very get-go. It's two themes throughout this section of Scripture. If you want to open up uh, to Ephesians chapter 3, that's where we're going to be studying if you want to go there on your app. Um, but there's two themes here. The first theme would be one in Christ, that we are united in Christ. And that's a powerful theme that we're going to talk a lot about in this message because it's a theme that Paul really stressed. The second theme that we see is that we are empowered through Christ. Out of that one in Christ, we are then empowered through Christ to this incredible, rich, powerful, life-giving Spirit of God that's in us uh, to accomplish so many things in life. So as we look at this and, and we study through this series, uh, just keep that in mind. So first, let's look at united in Christ. We are part of one body, one Christ. If we were to have everybody watching on video around the area shout uh, their church background, it would be a muddled sound with a lot of different uh, sounds, But if we used to say, who's your Savior? The answer would be loud and clear, Jesus Christ. It's more loud because it's the commonality that's in all of us. We are united in Christ. We live in divided times. I mean, wouldn't you agree that we are a divided country, that culturally we're divided, that politically we're divided? I mean, I would think so. I think we're just very uh, di divided, and it's almost polarizing. And in fact, so much so that an ad comes out, and people can't even agree about whether the ad is a positive or a negative thing based on which side of a lot of the arguments that you're on. And so we're divided. So it's really nice to come back in community in Christ and to understand, hey, we are one in Christ. This should be an, a, a, a light to darkness in this world. This should be an encouraging factor. This should be a place where the church stands out like a city on a hill. We are united. Listen to what Paul says beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read from this 
from the New Living Translation. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now he's talking to the Gentiles as well as the Jews, but at this point he's reminding the Gentiles that they're one in Christ as well. Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending the grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly spoke earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I've written, you, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now, by His Spirit, He's revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading this good news. Now, Paul's saying a lot here, but he's talking about mystery. He uses the term mystery four terms, four times. Now, we can think of mystery as the gospel, as, as it's something revealed. It's not mystery as in something to discover. It's mystery in the Bible times it was used as something to be revealed by God. And he uses this term mystery to describe the gospel. But more specific in this instance, not just the gospel, but the good news of the gospel that went out to all people, that it's also for the Gentiles as well. That's a giant implication uh, that had not been there before that people didn't get. Now, he uses the term mystery revealed because there's no way anybody could have come up with this on their own. If God had not given this to the apostles, if he had not given this to Paul, if he had not given the dream to Peter in the book of Acts that you can read about that where the Gentiles are being put, brought a part of it, there's no way it would have been intuitive to think that it was true. you got to understand, while it seems natural to us today that everybody should be included, it wasn't in those days. you got to understand... This was really hard for the Jews to grasp. Remember, in the Old Testament, they were God's chosen people. God chose them to bring about His Son, Jesus. That's, they were the chosen nation by which the Messiah would come. Now, they had heard that for years. They had read about that for years. They had read about the promised Messiah to come through them. And that became a crucial point of their faith. So much so that they began to view themselves as the important people, and everybody else is secondary because they were the chosen child. They were the favorite, so to speak, in their mind. And the prophets didn't understand this. They weren't given a picture of this. The angels in, of heaven, according to uh, some writing later in the New Testament, weren't even aware. What's, what's going on here? It just didn't make a lot of sense to them. In fact, did you know that a Jewish man, he prayed a prayer every day to thank God he wasn't a woman, to thank God that he wasn't a slave, and to thank God he wasn't a Gentile. They put all those in the same category and said, hey, I'm thankful that I'm not these things. And so you look at them, and they look down upon Gentiles. And here's the thing. Gentiles was everybody else. It, see, they looked at themselves, and then everybody else got lumped in. No matter your ethnicity, no matter your nationality, you were just a Gentile to them. You were uh, what some people would describe as an infidel uh, to them. And so they said, thank, thank God that I'm not a, a, a woman. Thank God I'm not a slave. And thank God that I'm not a Gentile. Now, what's ironic about that, what's interesting about that, is one of the first church Paul plants, Acts chapter 16, his first church had four people in it. And those four people, one was a Jew, one was a woman, one was a slave, and one was a Gentile. See, it's so counterculture and almost counterintuitive. Now, it's countercultural because the Jews believed they were the chosen people. They were the only ones. But it's counterintuitive because aren't we all people who are gravitate to people like us? And, and that's not completely uh, sinful in and of itself, but it is a part of our nature and a part of our fallen nature. We gravitate to people who are just like us. And so, therefore, we tend to often not think about others, and we don't get this unity. Now, what we want to do is jump back here to Ephesians chapter 2. There's a part of the passage we didn't get to cover last week because there's just so much to cover and it fits real well with this. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, listen to this. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews 
who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected their own bodies and not their hearts. In other words, it was just an outward action, not an inward action. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant, prom covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were people far from God, but now you've been brought near uh, to Him through the blood of Jesus. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles to one people when in His own body on the cross He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Wow, what powerful stuff he's saying there. Listen, you were once separated. You didn't know about the covenant, but Jesus broke all that down on the cross. He broke down the walls of hostility between God and man. And we read in chapter 2, verse 19, that we're called one family, one household. So we're not only part of one citizenship, one nationality, but we're part of one big family. Now, why is that? Well, there's three things that we have in common right off the bat that we need to know about. First of all, we have a common source of righteousness. Do you realize that? No one is righteous by their actions. No, not one, as the scripture says, and as the song uh, that I sing growing up sing, uh, the, we are not righteous on our own. One sin separated, we can't get there. It's only through the blood of Jesus. And that's the same for the Israelites, and that's the same for the Gentiles. You see, we have only one way to be made right before God, and that's the blood of Jesus. Him covering us in the blood of Jesus, putting on the clothes of Jesus. So we have one source of righteousness. Secondly, we have a common foundation. How do we, where do we look for truth as Christians? Where should we look for truth? Well, we look to Jesus, the Word, and His Word, the Bible. Paul refers to it as the apostles and the prophets teaching. In chapter 2, verse 20, we're united under uh, the apostles and the, and the uh, uh, prophets teaching under the authority of Christ. You see, we have one common authority. It's Jesus Christ. We don't have to make up what's right. We don't have to feel it inside of us always what's right, although we have some of that put in us by God through our consciousness and through the Spirit's guidance. But we know what's right and wrong ultimately from the truth of Scripture. And then finally, we have another common thing. We have a common mission, a common mission. In the uh, mission of Christ, that the, the go into all the world, make disciples, to love people with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, to, to, to love God with all your heart and soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, where we pick back up, listen to what Paul writes. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities of the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is, this is awesome. This is mind-blowing stuff that Paul's talking about here. Think about this. First of all, he says, this, one, this oneness, despite our differences, is a, a pointing to Christ's mission. And not only that, it's this eternal plan to display God's wisdom. Now, here's where it gets mind-blowing. Paul says that even the heavenly realms didn't get it till you see it through us and through Jesus. Even, in other words, the angels and the demons had no clue about this plan. They're looking, wonder what God's going to do next. Let's see what God's going to do next. And now it's revealed through Jesus. They get to see it, and they get to see it uh, 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 ongoingly displayed through us, through our purpose. And we give testimony to the heavenly and the earthly realm. So we have this common righteousness, this common authority, and this common mission. By the way, I want to re reiterate something that I always think is important. He doesn't say as individuals we shine this glory, we, we, we highlight this, we display this gospel. He says it's through the church. Now, we are individually members of the church, but we're just one part of the body. The church as a whole is what's connected. So what I'm saying here is don't miss in Paul's writings here and all throughout Scripture the importance of being in the church. The Bible doesn't grasp that you can be a Christian and not be a part of a body, not be a part of the church. That's a popular thing people want to say now, but that's not true according to Scripture. Paul knew no other way than collectively as the church 
and it's individual personalities making it up to shine the light of Christ, to be the church. And we are one in Christ. Now, I want to say a couple things about this one in Christ before we move in. It's really important to me. As we collect, it's not just about the mission. It's not just about our own building up. It's not just about helping ourselves feel loved. This is also about showing the world that we are under one God. And we may look different on the outside. We may have different tastes. We may have different likes, but we are one. We are to be a diverse people. The church should be a sharp contrast to the division of the world. And so we should be a reflection of our community and our culture. We should look uh, like we do. We should be a colorful reflection of the creativity and the unity of God. And, and that's why I'm so big at saying the church should be on the forefront of race relations, on, on rec racial reconciliation, on, on the unity that, that comes, the reflection of it. We, we got to be on the forefront of that. We can't just say, well, that's just a side thing, because that, that's not who we're called to be. We're to be one church and, and, and a mo beautiful mosaic of all different people. But it's not just about race either. The church should reflect the community uh, in race, but it should also reflect the, the community in so many other ways, in our ethnic differences and racial differences, but also in our socioeconomical differences. You see, the church should be a place where business people and where tattooed covered people come together. And they could be one and the same, by the way. It should be a place where old people and young people come together. It should be a place where the hipster and the hillbilly worship together. It should be the place where the people on either side of the political aisle should come together because no matter our differences on how we think this world should be run secularly, we have a commonality under Jesus Christ and His blood. We are together as one, and that's awesome. And Jesus is the unity we find in Christ is far superior than everything else. What unites us, Christ, is far greater than anything that divides us or separates us. And so we need to remember that. And I think there's really two major reasons this is important. Uh, there's one practical one, and there's one theological one, and both are important. The practical one is this, we're better together. That's just a fact. We are better together. Every one of you watching this right now, when we gather together in the same room, when we're separately living out our life, we're just better together. Science promises this. Uh, uh, science and, and, and lots of other studies. In fact, uh, I just read about a recent study in Forbes magazine released actually back in 2017. This is what it said. Decisions made and executed by diverse teams de delivered 60% better results. Did you hear that? When we're diverse. Now, we're sometimes more comfortable without the diversity, right? But we're better with it. We're better with it. 60% better results. We work better. It's not just about the job, but it's about everything in life. We know this on our own, right? We know that, that we learn better when we have other perspectives, and we don't have other perspectives in ourselves as much as that we talk to other people. We Here's the deal. Same breeds bias. It just does. Not intentionally, it just does. Oftentimes, same breeds bias. On the other hand, different can really breed empathy. And what is empathy? It's really trying to understand and, and, and to feel what the other person feels. Empathy helps us understand on the same level what others feel, and it's the ability to love people like Jesus loved people. Em empathy gives us the ability to to see people as God sees people. Now, how is that? Well, because through Christ, we get a better picture. And through other people, we get a better perspective. Now, that's the practical reason. There's a theological reason that's even more important, and it's still tied to that practical one. And that's that we get a better grasp of Jesus' love, and we reflect Him better when we're diverse. Why is that? How is that? Well, think about this. There is no one who's more different from Jesus than we are. We couldn't be farther apart. We, you know, he's all-powerful. We're weak and insufficient. He's all-knowing. We're limited in our knowledge of the universe. He's all-seeing. We only see things from one perspective, a limited perspective. He's able to live up to the standard and perfection of God. We're far from that, aren't we? We don't do it. We live a sinful life. There's no comparison. We're nothing like Jesus, if you think about it. I mean, he puts the love of God on display all the time. We struggle with that sometimes. 
And, and, and so when we look, there's just really no comparison. He couldn't be more different than us. He's entirely different than us, yet get this, he still loves us. He didn't walk away from different. He moved toward us. He moved toward different. He didn't shy away from different. He got right up next to different. He moved in the neighborhood. He said, let's, let's do it. Let's bring it on because I love you. And so when we love people who are different than us, we're putting on display God's wisdom and we're understanding that it's just him loving us first. God communicated to the world that he loved different by sending Jesus to die for him. And our love for others shows that we, too, believe in that gospel. The gospel is to display this beautiful mosaic of love. So unity in Christ is so important in the church. And Paul comes back to that theme again in chapter 4 at the beginning as well. So we said we we're going to talk about unity in Christ, one in Christ. Secondly, we're going to talk about empowered through Christ. And we'll run through this uh, f- fairly quickly, but it's pretty awesome to think about. So we're one in Christ, but as believers, we're also one in Christ and empowered by and through Christ. Now, I think we, as Christians, because Paul was writing to Christians. you got to keep that in mind. He was writing to Christians. And, and if I'm talking to a non-Christian, listen... I can't wait for you to experience this and get to know what this is all about. But those of you who are believers, you get that, right? You get that we are empowered through Christ. We have it in our head. But I think sometimes it really has a hard time traveling the the distance from the head to the heart, so to speak. I mean, when I think of this, Paul says, I fall on my knees in prayer for you. He says, I fall on my knees in prayer that you will get the richness and power of empower. Now, as, as LG said last week, we, we realize that we're dead in our sin, but through Christ we're made alive again, and we get that, and so we're saved. But sometimes we stop at the being saved part, and we forget the empowered through Christ part, or the really grabbing on. One of my favorite lines in all of uh, worship music is from How Great Thou Art. It says, when I think... Of God, His Son not sparing, bled and died to take away my sin. When I think about that, when I wrap my mind around how much He loved me to do that, it should, it should just blow our minds. And Paul says, when I think of this, I fall to my knees and pray, Father, Father. He says, beginning in verse 14, when I, fall, when I think of this, I fall to my knees and I pray, Father, the Creator of everything in heaven and earth, I pray that His glorious unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Do you get that? He says, I pray to, from His glorious unlimited, God has unlimited resources, that He will empower you with the inner strength. Now I'm starting to get excited here, church, thinking about this. As Paul says, I pray for you to get this. I, 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 I don't pray for you to get rid of all your hardness, uh, all of your, your hard things to go away, all your trials to go away. He didn't pray for that. He said, I pray that you get this unlimited resources, that you grab hold of it, that you understand how much we have it. Tim Keller puts it this way, because Paul's writing these saved people who maybe just haven't experienced yet. Tim Keller says, just picture it this way. Just imagine that you're poor. You live day to day, and then one day as you're living day to day and you're selling things to just get by, you remember that you had a long-lost relative that died and left you a CD uh, worth some money, a, a valuable investment. But you didn't think about it much at the time. You put it away, and she left some financial money. And when you realize it, you think, oh, I'm going to check and see what that's worth. And when you check, you realize it's worth all kinds of money because it was a decent amount, but the interest it's got while, while on deposit has just it's doubled or tripled. And you're thinking to yourself, how silly am I that I was living broke and poor all this time, and yet I legally had money. I legally had all kinds of money to my name. And I think we're that way spiritually. We have incredible riches, Paul says. And I'm not talking about financial wealth. I'm talking about incredible power through him. And yet we live as as if we're broke. And so many Christians live this phony life or this unfulfilled life or this lack of power life. Preacher uh, Jonathan Edwards says this. He says, think, picture it this way. He says, you know honey's sweet, right? You, you can know in your mind it's sweet. 
But it's only after you really taste it, you go, wow, I never realized how sweet honey is. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know the power and grace that God has put in us is, is good. But until you just grab hold of it, until you taste it, until you really grasp it, you don't really know. You don't know what you don't know. That's why the psalmist writes, taste and see how good the Lord is. Taste and see. And sometimes I think we just don't know it. We just, we, just, we just don't grasp it. That's why so many times somebody will be living a Christian life, a, a mediocre Christian life, an average Christian life, and they'll go on a mission trip. Or they'll go on an Emmaus walk weekend, uh, 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 Emmaus walk retreat. Or they'll go to best eight days, and they'll come back with a new fire burning for God. And they'll be like, I knew I was a Christian, but now I get it for the first time. And some people skeptically will say, well, that's just the emotion. Well, no, it's not. I've seen too many people's life be changed forever because of it. It's not just an emotional high. It's that you taste it. And once you really taste the love of God in an incredible way, you can't go back. And Paul says, that's what I want you to get. I pray that you can see it, that you can get it, that you can know it beyond anything you've ever dreamed. Church, every week I see thousands of people sitting here and I know that Hundreds upon hundreds of them are just going through the motions. They're just coming to church. Maybe they're paying what they think is their dues by throwing something in the tithe and offerings. And then they're going off to live this powerless life the rest of the week. No real change. No real anything. And that's not what it's called. That's not what we're called to be. We're meant for so much more to taste the power of God in our lives and to live in that power. To live the great life. That God has called us to. And so let's, it's, it's just what Paul wants to see, what, is, what I want you to see, to let it get from your head to your heart. Now, sadly, in so many churches, in most churches, you have to choose between the, the head, the, the, the logical side of things, the, the, the educational side of things, and the emotional side of things, let me just say, the experiential side of things. Uh, and what happens, most churches they, they, uh, that, that really focus on theology, theology, is there, and I love theology, they love to study the Word and get in the Word, but there's not a lot of power after they leave there because there is no experiential side of God. In fact, they're scared of it. Don't use that word. Stay away from it. And, and that's not what God wants. But maybe they've seen it abused, so they weren't. Then, unfortunately, far too many other churches are on the other side of that. They're all about the experience. They're all about the emotional highs. They're all about that. And, and they really don't either value, don't stand by, don't hold to the theology, the, the truth of Scripture. They don't have a biblical-centered theology. And that's wrong, too. But Paul, nor the Bible, knows the distinction between the two. It's a fusion of both together. Both come from God. We're made in Him. Don't run for the mystical because you don't understand it. And don't run from doctrine because you don't agree with it. Or you wouldn't choose that way. Instead, grab hold of both. Listen to what Paul says beginning in verse 17. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand as God's holy, or as God's people should, listen to this, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, uh, though it is too great to understand fully. In other words, this side of earth, we won't grasp it completely. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. This is so good. You, you have this power in your life. You have this power to overcome trial. Every trial you face, you have this power to overcome every obstacle you face. You have this power to overcome every temptation that Satan throws your way. You have the power to access this unstoppable power in Christ, this great power. And Paul prays that it's fuel. It's, 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 it's fuel. And I believe the gospel is actually the fuel for it all. It all comes back to the gospel. It's not all about what we do. In fact, think about this. Paul says, I want you to know how wide Christ's love is. Well, how wide is it? Well, the Bible says in Isaiah, though your sins are like scarlet, you shall be made white as snow. Though, though they are red as crimson, they shall be made like wool. 
In other words, we're covered in blood. We're dirty. We're sin. Our filthiness, or our, even our righteousness, is like filthy rags to God, like bloody rags is what that proper translation. But God takes them and he cleans us all up and he makes us whole. It's, it's his, wide, his love is so wide that even our darkest transgressions can be wiped out and blotted out. He says, well, how long is his love? Well, let me tell you how long it is. Jesus said, I give them eternal life that they will not perish. No one can snatch them away from me. Do you get that? No one can snatch them away from him. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Do you get that? That's how long it is that no one can grab you. No one can get you away from it. And then how deep the Father's love is. Well, it's so deep that Jesus went deep and sended not just from heaven to earth, but to the deepest, darkest of hell. How, how deep is his love? That he went to the darkest of places. He went to hell for you, took the hell for you to give you the reward of heaven that none of us deserve. None of us. That's the gospel. And that's power beyond. The gospel brings power beyond any imagination, anything you can ever dream. Now, I just want to close here by giving you something real practical. That's a lot of theological truth. And Paul, the first three chapters, he's going to do a lot of theological teaching. Then the rest of it, he kind of gives us some practical ways to apply that. And I just want to do that with this sermon today. You've got how powerful and deep this is. But I want to give you uh, what uh, Pastor Tim Keller would call prerequisites to this power. It's kind of the partnership. You know, God does all the saving for us. He saves us. We don't have to save ourselves. And then... It's still God's work in us that makes us more like Him, but He asks us to partner with Him. He asks us to do our part. And so here's some ways, the prerequisite to experiencing the power of God in your life that just come from, from uh, Scripture, from this passage of Scripture, actually, and also from just practical understanding. First of all, a dedicated prayer life. That's the first prerequisite. Paul's saying, I'm praying that you realize this. Now, if Paul's praying that we realize this, how much more should we be in prayer that we realize this? The implication is prayer helps us realize God's power. Prayer helps us grasp how long, how wide, how deep God's love is for us. Developing a regular prayer life is a way to tap into God's incredible resources and power. And yet we struggle with that. But we need to work hard at setting up a dedicated time, at, 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 at a dedicated system of prayer in our lives to lift up God. And uh, we, we'll talk a lot more about that uh, down the road. Uh, the second prerequisite, though, is this sustained obedience. This sustained obedience. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can be obedient all on your own power. We've already talked about that many times over. It's the gospel, and it's His power in us. That being said, you have to decide to be obedient and take some steps. You need to bring your life under submission under God. It's still His power. I always use the example of the walls of Jericho in the Old Testament. If you don't know that story, uh, basically God tells them to march around the walls of Jericho, the enemy, seven times. And then after they've done that seven times, blow the, blow the horn and he'll help them take the city. What happens is he, he brings down the walls after they do that. Now, no one would argue that the Israelites brought down that wall. They know it's God, but he wouldn't do it until they did what he asked them to do. And God wants us to be submissive in his life. We need to put our whole life under submission. Some of you are living in ways throughout the week, and you're saying, well, I'm covered by grace, so I'm going to go ahead and live that way. That's not living under the submission of God. You need to step down and experience God by setting your life in submission to Him and under His authority of His Word. You, for example, people complain they don't see the power of God, and they live sexually in ways that His, His Word commands us not to. Some people say, well, I'm just not experiencing God has the offer. And yet they're not even giving back to him generously the, the minimum that God would call us to do in, in tithing and offering. Some people say, well, why is my prayer life not as powerful as somebody else? And yet they refuse to forgive somebody who's wronged them. They just say, I'm, no, they don't deserve my forgiveness. I'm not going to give it to them. Since when is forgiveness about deserving it? I mean, we didn't deserve Christ's forgiveness. And so... When we refuse to submit our hang-ups and sins and lifestyles to Him, then don't expect to experience His power in the way that we should. I see this all the time. 
when we baptize people. People come, they want to get baptized, and what I find is a lot of times they just want to get baptized because they think that's that's the moment and everything else afterwards doesn't matter. And, and, and while I don't want to treat what comes after as work salvation, I want to say that it does really relatively, um, you can go in a wet center or a dry center and come out a wet center if you're not really wanting to submit to Him. You're not going to experience the power of His life. It's like trying to fill a bucket full of water while you got holes in the bottom of it. It's not going to work. The, the, the third prerequisite, though, was intentional community. I talked about the importance of gathering as the church. I cannot say it en- enough. I, I say it all the time. You must be connected to the body of believers. I believe that's why our community groups are such an important part of what we do. We say in our discipleship ministry that you learn, connect, serve. And those are equal pegs on the discipleship peg on a stool. And I believe that's true. And connecting and getting together with... with a, Paul mentioned several times in this passage the importance of the church, the importance of the body of believers together. It's a big part of it. And if you want to grow, you got to connect to a group of people that you can grow with collectively as well. And when you do this, the power of God is present. When you do these prerequisites, you'll start to notice things in your life, the fullness of of God. When it's the collective body of Christ, the cool thing is we don't get the glory. God does. You see, if we're just doing good deeds on our own, if we're just doing our own things, it can be an awful lot like it's us. We can get praised. But when it's the body of Christ doing it, it's kind of like my friend Dave Stone says, you can play for the name on the back of the jersey, which is your own name, or you can play for your name on the front of the jersey, which is the team name. And he says, picture that it says land on the back, and we can play for land's glory. But it's far greater when we play for Christ, which is the team name on the front of the jersey. There's so much more power at play that way. Here's my favorite part. That leads to my favorite part in all the Bible. I quote this passage all the time. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 on. Now all glory to God, who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or imagine, abundantly more than we ask or imagine, exceedingly more. We can ask or imagine a lot, and God can blow that out of what He can do so much more than we ask, so much more than we imagine. And then verse 21, glory to Him, listen to this part again, in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we realize the oneness in the body and the power of Christ, there's no limit to what God can do. Hudson Taylor says there are three stages to every great work of God. Impossible, difficult, done. And that is exceedingly more than we can ask or imagine. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for this word, this encouragement to tap into the spiritual resource, to remember that we are one, though we are many, that we are united no matter the color of our skin, the the name, uh, the, uh, the family name that we come from, the job that we do, whether we work on a line in a factory, whether we're the president of a bank, whether we're a doctor or whether we're a farmer, All of that, none of it. When we come in here, we are one in Christ, and that's the way we live it. And we live as one in your power, knowing that your power can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. If we grab hold of that, there's no end to what you're going to do through our churches in this region, in this community, and around the world, and in our own lives as well. Through Jesus Christ's name we pray.